Hello, people of the internet, and welcome to another Film Noir review. I am your host, Andres Perez, a.k.a. Kaiju Noir, and here with me, of course, is my good old buddy, Mr. Matthew Denian. Hello, everybody. Uh, as I always say, an honor and a pleasure to be here with uh, my good friend, Kaiju Noir, Andres Perez. And, um... Andres, we were going to originally do this review back on uh, what in the U.S. would have been Thanksgiving Eve. And uh, I just wanted to say uh, one thing I was very thankful for is our mutual friend, Chris Martinez, saying to me at G-Fest two years ago, hey, we're giving Andres an award. And I had no idea who Andres was. But I tagged along anyway and uh, thankfully met you. And since then, uh, you've become uh, you know, one of my most dearest friends and one of my best friends. And a uh, big thank you to Chris for... Uh, setting that up, man. So just want to throw that out there for everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. I feel like um, Chris has definitely introduced me to a lot of you guys. Has like it was thanks to James that I was able to meet Chris, and it was like through Chris I was able to meet like the rest of you guys in this small little G Fest um, creators posse of yours. And I've been very thankful ever since to have met so many um, talented, kind, um, amazing, inspirational people that have all. Um, served as a great inspiration for me personally, especially since I've decided to you know, try to follow in your guys' footsteps and try, try to pursue my own creative endeavors. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, shout out to Chris as well. Uh, so, how was your Thanksgiving, man? Uh, fantastic, thank you. Um, cannot complain. Luckily, uh, I went to a family member's house, so I didn't have to uh, cook or clean or anything else. So I was just lazy and uh, ate a lot. It was great. Uh, all right, that's very good. So, um, given that we are in the middle of the holidays, uh, things have been getting a little bit busy, but here is our second review. But before we get into the actual review uh, or get into the, today's subject, was there something that you wanted to pimp out, my friend? Yeah, uh, two things, actually. One uh, which relates very well to this, and the other one which does to some extent. Uh, for all of uh, my fans out there, um, Atomic Rex Conquest of Chimera will be launching on December 12th. I've just heard from Severed Press. So it'll be the third in the Atomic Rex series, as well as the second book in the uh, Chimera Scourge of the Gods series. Uh, so they're two of my uh, most popular monsters finally coming together. Uh, I hope everybody enjoys it. For our noir fans, um, one of the main villains from uh, Chimera, the Allison character, is heavily inspired by the femme fatale um, kind of character that we see in our noir films. Um, additionally, for um, Black Hill Press, I just had a volume 14 of Tales of the Shadowman come out, which has a new noir story by me featuring uh, Teddy Verano, who's uh, from the Mephisto book series as a noir detective, and a, a certain Scottish Highlander who's difficult to kill makes an appearance as well. So. All right, excellent. So for anyone who is a fan of Giant Monsters, who is most likely the majority of my subscriber fan base, um, you know, and if you love novels and you love to read and get, um, get into reading uh, these uh, so new uh, kaiju media that you probably never heard of before, I would highly recommend checking out um, Matt Denian's Atomic Rex series, as well as the rest of his uh, bibliography, I would say. Is that the right word? I'm so used to thinking filmography because I'm I'm not rarely do I ever delve into the world of novels and <laughs> literacy, literature. Uh, I guess uh yeah, bibliography catalog. Uh you know, just put a can you put a link to my website that would be the easiest way. People can Absolutely, follow. Yes. <laughs> if you want to check out the rest of his catalog of lit, of literary yeah. kaiju thrillers, then you would uh, certainly check out his uh his website, his Facebook page, and all the usual links that I include every time I have this guy on board on one of my channel, on one of my videos. So anyways, what is today's subject, my friend? Today we will be reviewing the 1994 noir classic, Double Indemnity. 94? Uh, 44, 1944. <laughs> I didn't know Sorry. this movie was that recent. <laughs> it's a reboot. You guys didn't know about it. The Asylum made it uh, back in 1994. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, pretty, it's pretty underground. You probably never heard of it. No, no. It, it stars Debbie Gibson and uh, Lorenzo Lamas, I think. Right? Those seem like two people they would get. Uh, no, my apologies. <laughs> it's late here. So. It's all right. <laughs> So yeah, you're right. We do have we are today we're going to be coming, covering the 1944 classic Double Indemnity directed by Billy Wilder, co-written by Wilder and Raymond Chandler, produced by Buddy uh, De Silva and Joseph Sistrom. Uh, let's see, based on the novel on the 1943 novella of the same name, uh, we have Fred McMurray as an insurance salesman. Uh, what's this? Uh, let's see, it was I know I had all the names here. 
Frederick Murray's uh, Walter Neff. Yes, character. Walter. We have Walter Neff. We have uh, Barbara Stanwyck as the uh, the what could he call it? The femme fatale, femme Phyllis, fatale. Mm, Phyllis Diedrichson. Mm. And let's see. We also have Edward G. Robinson as Keys. Um, yes. Who or uh, what was his name? Uh, Barton Keys to get the full name across. So in this story, we basically have an insurance salesman. Uh, Walter. And uh, sorry to be clear, Barton yes. Keys is the uh, claims adjuster. The claims the adjuster, right, right. He yes. works in the claims department, while yes. Walter works within the same insurance company as the sa- the door to door salesman, essentially. Yes, yes. Uh, so within this story, we have Walter and Keys. They're like this um, this uh, great working duo have this very strong uh, relationship, and Vol- Walter and Keys they come across. Uh, the Diedrichson, uh, Mr. Diedrichson, who is his very older fellow, who is married to a much younger, very attractive housewife and named Phyllis. Phyllis, she doesn't like him. She wanted, only married him for his money, but now she doesn't get his money. So she convinces Walter to cook up a scheme that allows Walter and Phyllis to uh, do away with Mr. Diedrichson in a way. And... Um, to use his Walter's expertise to um, take advantage of the uh, insurance company's tactics um, to sneak past their uh, methods and get away with double indemnity. Double indemnity is a clause within their insurance agency that allows them to get double the amount of money of double the amount of life insurance money in the event that the person who has the insurance dies, and so. Uh- what yes. should be dies in a very specific and unusual way is why it's a double indemnity clause. Very which true. Which is important as we progress in our review. Absolutely. And so, as of course, we from the very beginning of the movie, we realized that everything went to shit very, very quickly. Or actually, in everything went very bad, went south really badly. As we see an injured Walter stumbling into the office, um an empty office in the middle of the night as he sits down and regales his tail to, um, and to regales his tail to, uh, keys through, uh, an audio recording device. And at which point that serves as like the, uh, narration, the basis for the narration, um, throughout the entire story. Right. So this or film is done. The, sorry. Throughout <clears throat> the entire film. I mean, yeah, this film was done predominantly in flashbacks with, uh, the main character telling us what has occurred as we go forward. Right, right. And that gives us our first person narration, which has since gone on to become a key staple of the film noir genre. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, In fact, uh, a lot of films would borrow from double indemnity uh, noir style films going forward because it's uh, so well done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so we can sort of see like the progression from the Maltese Falcon to double indemnity. Um, and we see, like, we can see, like the beginnings of this genre. Even though we mentioned before that some uh, film like the Maltese Falcon wasn't literally, like, technically the first film noir, it was definitely one of the most popular and influential films that other film that later crime dramas, stylistic, um, stylized crime, crime dramas would later uh, take inspiration from. And Double, Double Indemnity is certainly a film that is also one of those progenitors as well. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. sorry, real quick, just to give credit, just like the Maltese Falcon, this originally comes from a novella by James Cain, mm-hmm. uh, James Cain in 1943. I don't know if we mentioned that or not, but mm-hmm. uh, thank you very much. Sure. And so um, usually within film noirs, we would often get like this omnipresent, not omnipresent, but I guess a somewhat of a semi omnipresent uh, narrator who would speak in the past tense where the main character was like, it was a dark and stormy night. She was there. I remember feeling very um, enthu- I remember feeling very enticed by her aroma. Usually that sort of past tense uh, narration style. On here, they found a really strong practical reason for why this person would um, be explaining the entire story in a past tense uh, context. And it was very interesting seeing that intro, seeing this mysterious dark figure stumbling, uh, hunched over, um, struggling to get to his office. And so I love that part in the very beginning where he mentions that he wanted the girl and he wanted the money, but he couldn't, he lost the girl and lost the money. And so it kind of gets the audience very intrigued as to what happened to this man as he begins to explain the, what happened to him. 
Yeah, it's a great opening uh, to get you hooked in the story, uh, mm -hmm. where it, within the first five minutes, you're already interested in how everything has occurred, like you said, to this guy and how he got to this point. Mm -hmm. Especially in the opening title sequence where we see um, the main character, uh, Walter, he is walking with a uh, fake cast and crutches, which is very unusual um, as he's walking towards the screen in a black, as we see him as a black silhouette with the large title um, played on, um, appearing on top of him, appearing yes. over him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, strange sig uh signals the strange visuals that makes the audience intrigued as to what's going on yeah absolutely it's a great um piece of uh of shooting as far as like for the director and the cameraman for how they they work that out uh to get you into the story right off the bat Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, when going into the actual story itself, it's very interesting how looking back on the Maltese Falcon and this film, these films being what are many considered to be like the one of the first examples, biggest examples of film noir, if not some of the best examples of film noir. Um, yeah. A lot of the, both of these movies don't really feature any of the classic tropes that y most people would tend to expect out of film noir. When people hear about film noir, they usually think of jazzy music, um, detectives, right. uh, like crime syndicates, uh, car chases, and uh, like uh, a lot of backstabbing. And there's certainly a lot of backstabbing either way. Um, in both films uh it's a lot of paranoia in both films you don't know who to trust but a lot of the other elements that people tend to expect out of film noir are at pretty much for the most part absent here and it's very fascinating to see how the genre started out so diverse before being wrapped up in these sort of tropes that most people look back on today right right um and you don't get uh like in the Maltese Falcon, there's no big shootout or big action scene uh, in this movie either. Um, you know, there's uh, some violence towards the end, but there's not like some, uh, you know, culminating um, action scene at the end. There's also um, the lack of a, of a really strong hero character. We get a little bit of it with Barton Keys, but for the most part, we're watching this from the perspective of uh, two, you know, villains, more or less, and despicable people oh, as yeah, you go through absolutely. the film. So. And, yeah, that's another very interesting thing because, yeah, for the most part, Humphrey Bogart, despite him being a very flawed, his character being a very flawed in individual, um, he was kind of a person who stuck to his morals throughout the end of the movie and kind of won in a very bittersweet way. Meanwhile, in this movie, you know that these characters are screwed from the get-go. Um, right. Especially when you see, well, as we mentioned before, Walter stumbling into his office uh, uh, seemingly injured and mentioning that right. he lost it all. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we know uh, he's going to fail and what we're going to watch him do. Uh, but that's part of what's so intriguing about the story, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. You know the destination, but it's the journey that's the most fascinating part. And exactly. uh, even on this latest viewing of mine, it still works. To, it's still a very effective movie where you are aware. Like, I'm, for me, this is well, it's probably like my third time watching the movie. And so I already knew what's going to happen, but I was still heavily invested along the way. Every single twist, every single, like every single twist and turn, every single obstacle the um, Phyllis and Walter have to leap over um, was still very uh, gripping, kind of like on the edge of your seat sort of material here. Yes, I also think like most really well done noir films, like when we review the Maltese Falcon, is that each time you go back and watch a movie like Double Indemnity, you pick up something you didn't catch the first time that you watched it. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there are many details here, especially like the sharp dialogue. Um, yes. I really love the uh, touch and go uh, flirty type of dialogue that Walter and Phyllis had, especially when they're making a lot of innuendos, a lot of like allegory, especially when they're talking about um, like cops and robbers where it's like, oh, I suppose you need to pull me over. What's the problem? And it's like, oh, shouldn't I get a ticket? You know, <laughs> then officer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and, yeah, where they're, mm -hmm. they originally, uh, the story starts out, uh, I'm not going to do forehead, but it was a great um like you said, a flirtatious moment um, where Walter is going to um, Phyllis's husband's house to renew his auto policy insurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he enters the house, she, she 
meets him in a bathroom and he makes like kind of a comment about, oh, you might need a little more coverage. <laughs> 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 right. Or it's like, I came here to see your husband and I'm thinking about there, there might be something else that's the reason why I should be here for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, another one, well, uh, perhaps like one of my favorite moments where like anytime Keys is involved in a scene with Walter, I just like, Keys is kind of like, he kind of comes off as like a, older, more experienced, hardened version of uh, Humphrey Bogart's character uh, from the Maltese Falcon, where he's been in the business for so long, he can, like, look you in the eyes, he can already tell what you're thinking, and, he, you know, he's already, like, figured out everything. Um, yeah, in fact, and when we first meet Keyes, it's a great uh, kind of establishment of his character, in that... Um, Walter walks into Key's office, and there's a, a gentleman there that Walter had sold a uh, insurance policy on a truck to mm -hmm. uh, several years ago, and the guy's claiming that his truck had um, caught on fire and he wants to be paid for it. And Key's like immediately has sniffed out that this guy had set his own truck on fire in order to gain the uh, insurance money, and um, says to him, you know, basically you can leave now with nothing, or we can send you to jail, type of thing. Um, but he's very uh, charismatic and very. Um, Staunch in his delivery to this character uh, mm -hmm. as it comes across, which really helps us establish who Keyes is and what he's all about going forward. Right, right. He has like a very strong sense of moral, uh, this strong like moral code, and he sticks by it no matter what and refuses to compromise. Right. Yeah, and like um, when he sees that something is not right with the death of Mister Diedrichsen, he goes out of his way to make sure he sees this uh, case through to the end. Yes, yeah, he's um, he's like a bulldog character that when he gets um, you know a hold of something, he's not letting it go until he finishes it off. Um, in fact, he makes several comments that he feels he's uh, got like a little man inside of him that won't yes. let him let these things go. Uh, so almost like an internal um, spider sense, if you will, <laughs> about when um, something is fishy about an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. Um... And I definitely love the relationship that Keys and Walter have, where it's almost sort of like a father and mutual, like a father and son experience, uh, like relationship, where Barton really wants to take Walter under his wing and like take him out of the uh, salesman position and makes him into a assistant and potential claimsman. And I really like the uh, back and forth banter during that one scene. It's probably one of my favorite scenes in the in the whole film that's not related to. Or actually, no, yeah, just in general, like one of my favorite scenes where <clears throat> he describes what it's like being a claimsman because uh, to Walter, he just sees that as just a boring desk job. And with him, with uh, Keys, he sees the, being a claimsman as not a boring de desk job, but sort of like uh, that of a surgeon and that his desk is like an operating table as he explores and dissects these twisted stories, um, analyze the the hopes and dreams of individuals that are trying to take advantage take advantage of the system so it's his job to make sure which ones are right which ones are wrong and he finds it all to be very intellectually stimulating whereas with uh walter he has a very physical job and that what what keys thinks is a job that anyone with brain with with bronze it rather than brains can do and he sees yeah. Walter as like that special guy who may have potential to be better than um, everyone else, than everyone else. Yeah, in fact, one thing that I think a lot of noir films take from this going forward is that um, even though in this case it's uh, uh, Keyes is a uh, insurance investigator and uh, Neff, Walter, Walter Neff is a salesman, is uh -huh. that it's almost comparable to um, future noir stories where you have like a uh, police station where you have a detective and then a beat cop where the detective sees a lot of potential in a beat cop and he's trying to say to him like, hey, you, you should go like become a detective. And it's like, no, I like, you know, doing the beat and walking around and, and then the detective is trying to explain to him how much um, more goes into being a detective as opposed to just sitting behind a desk type of thing. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That sounds very interesting then. Uh, let's see. And I also like that he there's a, like a very brief line here where um, Keyes mentions that he puts so much of time and energy into his job that he never really had time for marriage. And that the one time he had, he was almost got married, he had the little man who was, you know, uh, yeah. who was bothering him. And so he had to do his usual digging and found out that a lot of shady stuff was behind his uh his fiance and her family. Yeah, which again is kind of one of the 
pillars of uh, noir films, right? In that the hero or the anti-hero is pretty much always a loner, right? Which comes across again in Key's character, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. Even if we saw that with the Maltese Falcon, where right. uh, where uh, Humphrey Bogart's character... I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but I just I only see him as Bogart. Uh, Sam Spade? Sam Spade, yes. Thank you very much, Sam. <laughs> um, where he was able to... <laughs> Uh, was that a reference to uh, Casablanca? Oh, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong character. You're right. Uh, <laughs> Play it again, Sam, for old time's sake. Say it again, Sam. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. It's going to bother me. Sorry for this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's see here. It was, yeah, Sam Spade. That was his name. You got it right. Oh, good. I was right. Sam Spade. Thank idiot. you. I'm the idiot. Okay. Here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, uh, with. Uh, what were you gonna? What was I gonna mention? Oh yeah, he had to give up the chance of having the uh, the woman of his dreams, or uh, in order to pursue what was right. And right. it's kind of funny. We have a similar scene here where uh, Walter has to get rid of Phyllis once and for all, despite the fact that she, you know, um, pleads to her, pleads him to spare her, despite the fact knowing that she has actual legitimate feelings for her, although. <laughs> Walter and um, Sam are like very opposite characters and they their choices for their reasonings for getting rid of their respective lo love interests are very opposite in terms of morality. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that Phyllis's character in this, uh, to me, is the defining femme fatale going forward that kind of sets the standard for all their femme fatales afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. and, and how manipulative she is of all the men in particular around her. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, as we go through the when we start when we initially see Phyllis, we just see her as kind of like a, a what do you call a, what we would call today a gold digger, someone who would marry someone simply for their money. Um, then we re learn that she was actually his, uh, his uh, her husband's uh, ex former wife's uh, nurse. And so after she was used to be the nurse of the previous wife, and then when the previous wife died, she supposedly uh, was there to act as like a emotional support for Mr. Dietrichson and eventually married her. And now she's stuck with a family that where the daughter hates her. She does not like the daughter. The uh, and her husband doesn't always uh, berates her, uh, supposedly physically abuses her and never lets her do anything or spend any money. Uh, so we see her as kind of like this woman where she's bored with her life and she wants a way out. But as we go through the movie, we find out that she has been scheming and conniving and backstabbing her way. She's been doing all of this stuff to get her uh, in order to get to the top. And she, we realized that she was willing to um, throw anyone and everyone under the bus just for her to come out on top. Right, right. Um, so uh, to go back to the beginning of the story, just, I, I think so your audience is following, right? That, um, yeah. Uh, when Walter goes to the house, to he's initially going there to renew the husband's auto policy, like we said, and uh, Phyllis first comes to him in, in her bathrobe, and uh, then says she'll be right down and makes a point of putting on a um, – you know, pretty tight fitting dress, and what I guess oh, for the yeah. 40s <laughs> would be uh, pretty risque in an anklet, which they focus on quite a bit. Mm. Um, and that, um, you know, Walter's kind of talking there and looking at it, and then they start flirting with each other and kind of, uh, you said, use this great double talk for like, you know, as Walter says a line, she talks about getting pulled over. Um, mm -hmm. It's all in the context of them flirting with each other mm -hmm. uh, until um, she mentions, uh, Phyllis mentions that, is there any way for her to get uh, life insurance on her husband? And she kind of puts it out there that uh, he's an oil baron, I guess. And, uh, you know, sometimes she's kind of around the uh, pumps and everything, and she's afraid that uh, he could be killed. Uh, Walter immediately is able to sniff out that this is, uh, you know, her perhaps setting up her husband uh, to be murdered right. and then collect the insurance on it. So initially, he he says he wants nothing to do with her or this plan or anything else mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, kind of attempts to leave. Um, but as he's walking away, he's haunted uh, kind of by the thought of the possibility of 
you know, there might be money in this for him, and he's clearly um, love struck with Phyllis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on their first meeting. And um, Phyllis goes so far as to follow Walter back to his apartment, and when she enters his apartment, quickly convinces him to go along with this plan. Right. So this is kind of like where uh, someone, like with Walter and Sam Spade, Walter Neff and Sam Spade from the Maltese Falcon, both of them are kind of like... Um, very charismatic, fast talkers. Um, they try to, um, they do a lot of flirting with the femme fatales. And this is like the thing where their paths diverge, where where <clears throat> um, Sam Spade was always someone who pretended to play into the femme fatales uh, scheme only to come out on top in the end. Uh, only whereas with here, Walter, he immediately falls for Phyllis and just like, essentially just falls into her trap. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, one of my favorite parts about this uh, movie is how Walter puts together the plan to off the husband and how he really covers almost every possible angle that could go wrong, mm -hmm. um, except for an unseen one that comes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the basis of the plan is that um, – Walter goes back to sell the husband to car insurance. Right. He insists on having somebody else there to hear their conversation, in which case they bring in um, uh, Lola, the, the husband, Lola, yeah, the daughter from the uh, first marriage, who mm -hmm. isn't that much um, younger than his wife at this point, I think is uh, we right. should point I, out. Right? I feel like they tried to make her look younger, uh, like the hair, maybe like the bow. Did she have a bow tie? I'm not sure. I believe, yeah, she did. I just watched the yeah. recent today right. she did. But yeah, they try to make her look, appear younger. But yeah, she doesn't really look that much younger. She looks like she could easily be in her uh, early to mid-20s. Oh, in fact, they reference that um, the boyfriend, the daughter's boyfriend, uh, Zaketti, uh, is 28. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's okay. 20. So she's got to be at least in her, I'd say, early to mid 20s right to make that right. kind of workable although this was the 1940s so we're not sure like what the age gap was that was until it was considered taboo right right um but anyway she's it, maybe like 15 years difference between her and her mother just for perspective or the right. stepmother i should say right right um, phyllis, phyllis and walter they appear to be people in their like uh early to mid 30s Right. Uh, and the husband is significantly older. He's like in his 50s. 50s yeah. yeah. So um, at any rate, uh, Lola quickly, um, you know, decides to leave. But Walter makes a point of, um, you know, briefly mentioning life insurance to her father before she leaves. And uh, after she leaves, Walter, Walter offers the car insurance policy to the husband and then asks him to sign another copy yes. um, for his own records, which is in fact the life insurance policy that he has now signed. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of clever in and of itself and then was super clever was um, the way that he and Phyllis carried out the eventual murder I felt like uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that oh, before yeah, you get yeah. to it? It, was, it was brilliantly executed and it kind of reminded me a lot of the how much they were able to get away with such a dastardly scheme uh, especially since this was during the 40s and again there was a lot of censorship back in the day especially with the Hayes Code still in action and yeah. so I really liked how they even pulled off the actual murder of Mr. Dietrichson himself, where it happens off screen, but you hear the struggle as like Phyllis is like smiling and it's such a, like a very dark twisted scene. And it's like the whole thing where what you don't see is more horrifying than what you do see. And we le later learn that the autopsy showed that uh, Mr. Dietrichson had a broken neck. So you can only imagine how horrifying that must've been for Walter to snap an old man's neck. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it all happens off screen. And then you see the Walter, he's, you know, in disguise pretending to be Mr. Dietrichson going into the train, walking to the back of the train, jumping off the train and putting uh, Mr. Dietrichson's body there for the police to later come and identify. And there's this one yeah. moment, Sorry, uh, there was this one moment that reminded me a bit of Psycho, where if you remember, we, there's another similar scene with Psycho where we see Norman Bates trying to dispose of the body of his victim. And so he puts the body, there's this very long process of him washing the blood, making everything, the um, getting rid of all of her belongings, putting the wrapping the body in the in the shower curtain putting in the car putting yeah uh and then there's that little moment where both character in both movies the characters are alarmed that something might go wrong 
funny enough, both of them have to deal with cars, where with Psycho, yes. he pushes the car into the uh, lake, and there's a moment where the car stops sinking, and you have that, like, heart, like your heart skips a beat, saying, oh, shit, this could go wrong. And then it continues to sink, uh, continue sinking, much to his relief. In this film, they try to get away from the train tracks after dumping Mr. Diedrichsen's body there. They get into their car. <gasps> oh, shit, the car doesn't start. And then it starts, and like, whew. Yeah. And um, as we're doing it, too, they, they go through all the other um, steps that Walter took leading up to the murder um, in order to make himself right uh, known as not being an accomplice. So, for instance, he purposely um, takes uh, one of his like contact books from work and acts like he left it at work to go back. And he makes a point of uh, driving his car into the basement of where he lives and asking the guy who washes the cars there to, you know, wash the car. And then he right. goes out the back door to... Um, Phyllis's house to carry out the murder. He also even takes um, steps, which uh, I thought this was really neat, yeah. where he places cards inside of his uh, doorbell, doorbell and as well as his phone, yeah. uh, which if they were disturbed, he knew that somebody would have tried to visit him or to call him. Uh, so he really does cover a lot of um, different bases there. And it was uh, it was just really neat to see because he's in the business, how he knew what we'd have to do in order to um, deflect any attention from himself. Now, where their plan falls apart at is that the husband, uh, Phyllis's husband, was supposed to go on a uh, train to his um, reunion up at Stanford, I'm pretty sure. Right. And uh, although I have to tell you real quick, uh, when he, their husband's mentioning this, uh, mm -hmm. Walter says to him, like, oh, did you um, – you know, play football there? And the guy says, yeah, junior varsity, almost made varsity. And I'm thinking, like, why on earth would anybody brag about that? It's like me saying, you know, I played intramural <laughs> basketball when I was in college. So, yeah, it wasn't good enough to make the real team. But uh, anyway, I thought it was funny. Um, yeah. But the key is uh, that his uh, – the double indemnity clause, which we mentioned if uh, somebody is killed in an obscure way, uh, kicks in to double the price of the life insurance. So in this case, um, because there's plenty of studies that indicated, at least in the film, that death on a train is extremely unlikely, uh, there was a clause that if the husband died as a result of some kind of a train accident, mm -hmm. that their payoff would go from $50,000 to $100,000. Right. And uh, this is all thrown off. When the husband breaks his leg, and it looks like he's not going to be able to go on this trip. Right, right. Um, so uh, there's also other interesting things that they set up about, like uh, Walter and Phyllis meet at a grocery store where they look like they're not really talking to each other, kind of like – Yeah. and yeah, uh, across, I'm Sorry, go ahead. Just kind of like across the aisle or their backs are to each other talking. So go ahead. Please fill in. Oh, I just love them, how those scenes are – how those shots are set up where – um, they have these very extreme close-ups of the two characters talking to each other as people are walking by them. And it, it makes it feel very claustrophobic. Like, you see a lot of the placement of the of the uh, the supermarket products. Um, you know, again, people cross um, passing by them left and right. It's like a very... it's Even though it should be a big open area, it feels very cramped. Like, they can't... There's not a lot of room. There's not a lot of time for them to say what they want to say. Right. We use the term supermarket, but it's not like a supermarket people would think of today with big, right. long aisles and right, high right. stacks. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's you more know. Like, like a marketplace, I would say. Yes, yeah. Grocery store, yeah, that's a better uh, term. Right, right. Like, um, uh, around here, I feel like if you were like at a gas station Wawa or something, you could stop into, and, and it's very tight there. I feel like that's almost what it's like. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Kind of like a modern-day convenience store. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you said, there's a great scene then where um, Walter dresses up like the injured um, husband and he sneaks yeah. into the back of um, Phyllis's car as they're pulling away uh, with the husband in the car. And then um, the horrifying scene really where you see just Phyllis's face and her reaction, which, uh, you know, credit to Barbara Stanwyck because she really does make that kind of like a horrifying scene with just her face and her reaction to her husband being killed in the back. Yeah. Um, I thought was fantastic. Um, so they make a point of uh, uh, Phyllis walking to the train with her husband and insisting that she wants nobody to help him, that her husband's a proud man, which is, of course, because it's Walter in disguise and they don't want too many people to take a close look at him. Right, right. Uh, 
So Walter's plan is to move to the back of the train uh, for the to the observation platform, mm -hmm. uh, and he's just going to jump off the back as the train's only going like about 15 miles per hour or something like that. Right. Um, and, but their plan hits another small snag uh, when there's a guy who's from Medford, Medford, Oregon, as he right. makes a point of saying multiple <laughs> times, <laughs> uh, who's just kind of out there having a cigarette and shooting the breeze. And um, Walter has to quickly think of a reason to send this guy back inside. So he makes a comment that, um, oh, I forgot my cigars. It's a pain for me to go get it with this broken leg. Can you go get them for me? So the, the gentleman agrees to go do so. And at that point, Walter jumps off the back of the train, which leads us to what you said about um, where the car won't start because Phyllis is there and they switch out the husband's body. Right, right. And it's that um, encounter with that one man that leads to another one of my favorite moments where I noticed, uh, um, to excuse my language here, but there are a lot of uh, numerous of these like, oh shit moments in yes. the movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I mentioned the previous one with the, um, with the car not starting, like them not being able to get, they're potentially not being able to get away from the crime scene. There's another scene where we go back to that person, uh, Jackson, that was his last name. Yes. Um, he is interrogated by Keys, and Jackson says, oh, this is not the, here's like, this guy, that's supposed to be Diedrichson? Oh, the guy I saw, that's not Diedrichson. Like the moment where Walter sees him, and there's, um, in the hallway as he's about to go to his office and stops, looks back, he's like, oh no, it's you. <laughs> Um, another moment where he calls, uh, where it seems like Walter and Phyllis are, um, are free. It's like they, the insurance agency has given up on the, on their, on Phyllis's case and are going to give her the double indemnity, uh, money. And then, so being all proud and cocky, he, Walter invites, uh, Phyllis over. But then at the same, right after that, Keys shows up at his door and you're thinking, oh yes. God, if Key sees Phyllis there, it's going to, everything's going to go to hell. And the scene is shot where, um, there are, Keys is in the hallway talking to Walter and he hit Walter's door is open and Phyllis is just standing behind the yes. door. It's not like she's hidden in under the bed or something like that. It's just, right, right. if Keys takes three more steps, he sees her. Right, right, just hit hiding in plain sight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This movie does a lot does a lot well with its uh with its uh drama and setting up these very intense situations. Mm -hmm. Uh let's see. And the key yeah. Keys goes there another important key uh key point. Um uh, is that uh uh when the you, like you'd mentioned, they originally decided to pay her off because um, the head of the company, I guess, at first is saying that he doesn't find that this person just died by falling off the back of the train, the husband. He thinks it's a suicide. And uh -huh. it's Keen who lays out all of these statistics about how extremely unlikely that is and that they're basically just going to have to pay this, um, what at the time would have been a huge policy of $100,000 uh -huh. um, for the person dying. And uh, Keyes is kind of done with it. But it turns out that, um, and this is one of the breaking points with a broken leg, that the husband had an insurance policy if he was injured, which he didn't kick in when his leg was broken. So that's what sets Key's little man off, if you will, about um, something's not right here. And that's why Keys goes and explains that to Walter, that if he broke his leg, why didn't he enact that policy at the time? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of and, like one of those signals one of those signs that despite how smart and how carefully thought out uh walter's plan was you know there was always something there that was going to screw him over from the get-go you know of course right. he could have waited for another chance perhaps when his leg wasn't broken or perhaps not use the train or whatever but um of course he had to do it fast he had to do it now it's a lot of that he had to fall he had to get he had he had to go for that double indemnity clause you know he it's that greed that takes him over that takes over his thinking as much as he wants to clear his mind and make him want he wants to think things clearly as clearly as possible obviously that greed is what gets to phyllis and walter right even more so phyllis because walter does mention uh you know it's it's off for now we can't do it with the broken leg and uh it's phyllis who pushes him to do it at this point and and it's uh, then when she hints that he might be physically abusive to her, the husband. Uh, not that, you know, we saw that. We do see the husband's kind of... Grouchy. In, 
Grouchy, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, but we, we don't see any indication uh, that he's necessarily abusive to her or, right. you know, anything else. So, yeah. And that could be just one of the many lies she puts up, she uses just to put up this facade that she's this, like, innocent victim when we know that there is much more heinous cr- um, stuff she has done in the past, which we'll get into very quickly. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and um, by the way, speaking of the boss, uh, it was very funny how the boss seemed so confident that it was a suicide, and then, like, um, Keyes was able to tear his uh, yeah. theory apart. And he's like, you know what, I did thought, when you mentioned suicide, I thought about that for about three seconds, and then I realized, <laughs> and then he just gave a bunch of reasons why that wasn't going to be the case, because he's like, I've looked at, like, hundreds of stories, um, I've looked at all kinds of suicides, I've seen all kinds of motives, all kinds of reasons, and not one of those suicides has ever <laughs> yeah. been jumping off a train. Yeah. Yeah. And also, didn't the scene, the boss, like, the actor who played the boss seemed kind of a, uh, n- not erratic, uh, very uh, strange in the way he had these, like, very big, wide eyes and, kind of, like, an, uh, enunciating certain words in a very strange way. He's like, I know what happened to Mr. Diedrichsen. I know it was not an accident. It was suicide. Yeah, I, I think he was supposed to be a little bit of a comedy relief, or at the very least, like, you know, most people think their bosses are clowns, so, <laughs> you know, portrayed in that in that type of way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it came across well, and then it's just great when Keys like, so cuts him down with stats after stats and suggests to him that he has to do his own, the boss to do his own homework and read some of the, uh, you know, like, volumes and volumes they have on the way people die that's in their own office that he yeah, doesn't yeah. know. <laughs> and he's like, hey, man, just because I'm the boss doesn't mean I'm not smart myself. And then it just has his plan that blows up in his face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, including bringing in um, Phyllis, who, uh, you know, tells him that she doesn't like him very much because he suggests it's a suicide. Right, right. And that he's kind of like a rotten human being himself. Meanwhile, Phyllis is, you know, the most rotten person in the story. But yeah, they thought yeah. to the boss that he's rotten. So. <laughs> right, right. And so, let's see, speaking of Phyllis, I really liked how, as, during this time, there's that paranoia that sets in, um, Walter and Phyllis can't be together, so in the meantime, we see, uh, Walter hanging out with Lola, Mr. Dietrichson's daughter from his first marriage, and, you know, as a means of, he tries to play somewhat of a surrogate parental figure for Lola, trying to be, tries to play, be sympathetic to her, uh, tries to stay on her good side, um, tries to, uh, you know, he initially gives her a ride to um, Zaretti. Uh, just by, uh, yeah. Z- um, no, z- Zagetti. Zagetti. Spaghetti. Yeah, Zagetti. Yeah, 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 it sounds like spaghetti. It's like spaghetti, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so he takes her to see uh, Zagetti, um, despite the father not wanting to. So he's trying to be on play on her good side. And it's through Lola that she learns that he learns that um, Phil is most likely, it's like 90% sure that. She killed. She was the one responsible for the original wife's death because she was her nurse. She left all the uh, all the windows and doors open so that she can get as cold and sick as possible and die eventually. Eventually, die a couple days later. And yes, uh, Mary. Lola, uh, yeah. Sorry, Lola also notices uh, prior to her father uh, leaving for this trip, which is killed on that. Um, Phyllis is trying on sort of like the black veil that it would be traditional for, um, you know, a, a wife to wear after her husband passes. And she's kind of smiling about it in the mirror, what sticks out to her as well, given the history of um, her noticing that she had really set her mother up to die as well. Right, right, right. And so, again, it's a lot of that cockiness and um, greed, that um, ego that gets to that gets to Walter is gets to um phyllis as well for doing something so stupid that could like um that could bite her um that could uh come back to bite her right and it's uh it serves two purposes for walter to interact with lola originally he's lola being the daughter he's first um tries to spend time with her to keep an eye on her to make sure that she's not going to go to the police or anybody uh you know kind of with this information about phyllis and then secondly um, Walter even mentions he starts to kind of feel um, bad for Lola that he has killed her father. So as you had mentioned, he sort of tries to fill that role for her a little bit as like a, you know, strong male figure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it's um, – and Phyllis points it out to Walter later. But it does like create kind of this very weird dynamic where you're like, why is this guy hanging out with this younger girl? It just seems mm-hmm. odd. 
but yeah. um it was a 19, really, it was a 40s it was okay back in that time yeah i guess so but it, it, <laughs> it's yeah <laughs> but it's really like for those two purposes to keep it on her and then he's clearly has some guilt about killing her father right right and that's kind of like one of the reasons why we follow him and not uh phyllis through the majority of this movie right phyllis uh, has no conscience right as the right. film goes on Right, right, right. It's only until, like, the very end does she get a conscience, only by then it's too late for her. Right. Um, and while Walter is hanging out with with uh, Lola, we learn, shockingly, that Phyllis has been hanging out with Lola's ex-boyfriend, Zaretti, uh, uh, Zaghetti. And that's another, like, big shocking twist in the story, where it's later, we, uh, Walter seems to think that Phyllis, because she can't be with Walter now, she's trying to get with Zagetti, so that maybe, possibly, Zagetti, she can use Zagetti against Walter. And then we later learn that Phyllis was trying to use Zagetti to get, um, to knock out, to take Lola out of the picture. Yes, yeah. So, uh, they certainly hint that, um, Phyllis was uh, sleeping with Zaketti as well. But at the very least, yeah. um, she's laying the idea in his mind that Lola is uh, unfaithful to him and running around and wants nothing to do with him. Right, right. That uh, type reason, of thing. She was the reason why for breaking, for having uh, Lola and Zaketti break up off screen in the first place near the, uh, cent- near the, like, the middle of the movie. Right. And uh, what occurs is once uh, Walter finds out about Zaketti and he also um, keys, meanwhile, is filling in Walter, unbeknownst that Walter is the, the culprit in this thing, about right. his progress on the case. So, um, a, you know, once uh, keys, as you mentioned in that great scene where he brings in uh, the Jackson character uh, to identify that the man that he saw was not uh, Phyllis's husband, uh, keys is pretty set on that he's got. Phyllis set up and he makes this really cool allusion to um you know it's got to be two of them and uh what they don't realize is that when murder is involved it's like two people on a train and uh they're heading uh they can't get off unless they get off together I think right. it's a trolley it, was, it, it was a trolley yeah it was a trolley yeah yeah when two people get on trolley they, yeah they have to stay until the very end and the end in this case is the graveyard he says uh, yeah. you know, so it's gonna die and that kind of really hits home for Walter when he realizes that he has got to find a way to get off of this trolley uh-huh. so when um, he realizes that Zaketti's now in the mix he begins to think that he can shift uh, you the know blame. the blame to Zaketti and making him the patsy uh, yeah exactly making him the patsy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead Okay, I was going to say, and um, it kind of, cul- all these uh, reveals kind of culminate in this ultimate um, showdown between, no, it's not so much a showdown, but ultimate confrontation between uh, Phyllis and uh, Phyllis and Walter. Although before that, he had a conversation with her saying, like, listen, we got to break it off. You cannot do go for the double indemnity because um, there's, too mu- there's too much evidence against you. You have to drop it. And she's like, no, I'm still going to go for the double uh, for that money. I don't care. We're in this together. That's why we that's why we killed. Uh, we did. We shouldn't go through all this trouble just for nothing. And right. Yeah. And then accuses him of being going soft on Lola, thinking that you know, she was she uh, he was hanging out with her not just to shut her up, but also for because he is guilty and wants to back out and perhaps you know maybe potentially be with Lola instead of uh, Phyllis. It's not really impl- it's it, it's definitely implied, but it's never really outright stated that uh, there is any romantic tension between the two of them. Oh right, between uh, Walter and Lola. Right. Yeah, right. It's, it, and they sort of kind of hint around it, but there, there's nothing that uh, they show where that's that shows that it's there. Right. Um, right. So. Uh, that, but it is, that's the breaking point for Walter is when right. he realizes that she's not going to let the court case go. He realizes he has to do something. Right. Um, because she's going to lose either way. Like if she decides to go to court and try to get that money, she is going to lose. And she doesn't seem to be, want to let go of it because she's already in it too deep. She feels she's already in it too deep and wants to see it to the end through the, through, see it through to the end. Right. So Walter makes a plan. To, uh, he calls Phyllis and says he's, they're going to meet at, their, at Phyllis's house um, to turn all the lights off, that the police aren't a concern anymore. Um, because Keyes also lets it be known that he's basically, you know, one step away from having her arrested and whoever her accomplice is. Right. Uh, who he's kind of looking at Zaketti at this point as being the potential person yeah. uh, to do so. It is interesting, though. Um, as you mentioned, the relationship between um, Keyes and Walter, that as a uh, Walter's listening to Keys uh, recording on his dictaphone. 
Keyes briefly mentions that he does not at all think that Walter is uh, the person who's behind this. So I guess that maybe the boss had suggested it because he says, um, you know, he's known Walter for so many years and he personally vouches for him on top of the evidence that Walter had left about what he was, you know, uh, right. Went back to the office and had his car be washed. All all the alibis. Yeah. Right. Uh, that he had established. So as you as a viewer, it's kind of like another sad moment where you realize that he's betrayed uh, this mentor figure, I guess would be a good way to yeah, explain definitely. the relationship. Like, we, d- we don't really see Walter interact with anyone else in that office. Um, so we can only assume that Bar- uh, Keyes is the only guy he really has any sort of relationship with outside of like, right. interaction with his boss. But even then, it seems like both Keyes and Walter are very distant from the boss because the boss is they see the boss as someone who like sits up in his desk all high and mighty while they right. are down in the um, down in the nitty gritty of it doing all the hard work. Right, right. And then uh, the story culminates with um, Walter going to um, Phyllis's house. And it's kind of a replay of when they had first met. which they even... Right. It's kind of like it comes full circle, meeting in the same room, only it's much darker. Like the move, the, I'll get into like the cinematography um, before we finish, wrap things up. Yes. But when we get into, when we see that them into that room, um, you know, it's a very darkly lit room. It has the, uh, what, what the, I forgot what the, what the name of those blinds are, but it's those like specific type of blinds that cast this really amazing, very cool stylistic shadow across the characters, the walls, the furniture. It kind of comes off as like reverse, like almost like, uh, how would you call it? Horizontal prison bars in a sense. Oh, I hadn't noticed that, but you're right. Yeah. They do give off that, um, appearance. Yeah, where it's like it's like the mix the it's like instead of having full lighting or full shadow shade full lighting or full shading, it's those blinds give you uh, the best of both worlds, mm-hmm. and it's the I believe this could have because this is one of the earliest examples of film noir. This could have been like another progenitor, like this could have been like the birth of the of the blinds of the shadowy blinds uh, trope of uh, cinematic technique that future like dozens upon dozens of film noirs would later utilize in their films right right and i think it's um you had mentioned and, and you know much more about filmmaking than i do but um there was in a multi falcon as great as it is they don't always use shadowing to the best right we mentioned that before how it was like a very early example so like the story was film noir but like the cinematography wasn't there yet and right. here we get a lot of that beautiful shadowy uh cinematography here yes yes yeah and uh, it's super well done and the story culminates with um Walter going there and basically laying out to Phyllis that he can set it up so that um, with the information he has that uh, it was her and Zacchetti who had kind of uh, planned this whole thing. And even hints that he might off her and make it look like Zacchetti did it and then set Zacchetti up. Right. Oh, and within the scene, we're back in the room, but now the room is it's um, it's not now it's nighttime and the room is much darker than before. <laughs> right. So within the first movie, we already see that with those uh, with those blinds, it makes it look like like a prison, like he's already trapped in Phyllis's cage, and here yes. now he's even deeper into her web with a light with the lighting almost down down to zero. And, and there's another uh, a great thing where when he walks in, he mentions what's that music, and she says, "Oh, it's from outside." Uh, you know, like there's somebody just playing a radio or, or something like that, and. Um, Walter finally says, like, I've had enough of the music. So he goes over to close the window. Mm -hmm. And as he does, and he turns around, it's Phyllis shoots him in the arm, which is the injury, as you mentioned, he has in the beginning. But I thought that was kind of cool, too, about, like, the music's done now. The story's done. And that's Uh, where it goes. Yeah, I didn't didn't pick that up, but that was really cool. (laughs) Um, I thought it was kind of stupid on his part that he didn't think that she would try to kill him off. Like, she didn't have a gun ready for him. So I thought it was really strange that he would turn her his back on her, despite not trusting her. Right. And I think that was just, again, part of uh, what works so well for a femme fatale is that characters in these stories often... Um, uh, don't quite give them the credit that they're due. What's one of them? Like undervalue? Oh, yeah, or... they're, they're portrayed in as uh, they like portray themselves being like a much weaker in a much weaker position. And I guess yes. like, the weaker you appear, the stronger you secretly are. Right. Underestimate. He underestimates. Yes. yes. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. 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 And the word I was thinking of for the boss was eccentric. Oh yeah, that's that's the word for the boss. Yeah. yeah, that's don't you hate it when like there's a word on the tip of your tongue that you really want to say but you don't know it, and then you realize it like <laughs> like moments later or like hours or days later. 
in, in particular, we're doing a recording because, you know, usually I feel, you know, feel like I know these isn't talking to somebody, but because we're on the spot, it's just not yeah. there. So. <laughs> um, Them's the breaks so, uh, when you're not going the scripted route. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, that's we're real people, man. So yeah. That's how we do. <laughs> we, um, like to, we like to do our our analysis. Our analysis is real, son. <laughs> that's right. Our analysis is, 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 is real. <laughs> our, our, anal, our analysis, I. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there goes our there goes our uh, our cover for being pseudo intellectuals. Uh, I don't our, think it was much of covers. There we go. With. Our facade. That, our that was facade. a bad word. There goes our there facade. We, go. <laughs> we need better shades, I guess, to you know to cover this. Yeah, song. yeah, we need. Yeah, we need to <laughs> cover that. We can cover it. It, it, and open that window more, so more music comes in. Ours isn't done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't uh, mind. There's too much directing in this podcast. <laughs> we need Orson Welles. That's the problem, man. We don't have Orson. <laughs> Let's see. So, uh, in the end, we have uh, Phyllis. She shoots. Uh, she shoots Walter. Walter uh, plays up to her sympathy. She, Phyllis realizes that she never loved him up until this very moment. And she couldn't bring herself to shoot Walter while Walter shoots her twice, I must add. Yeah, at point blank range. She right, twice. right. He's like, Jesus Christ. And again, you know, this is the Hayes Code. I'm surprised they were able to get away with this. Uh, there was actually, they, they really had a difficult time getting this movie picked up. Um, oh. Yeah, the copy I got was the Turner Classic Movie version. So they had like an intro mm -hmm. um, by one of their hosts. And he had mentioned that like five studios turned this film down yeah. um, until it was finally picked up. Right, right. Um, I couldn't definitely see that. I like, I maybe have also read some, at some or something somewhere that uh, some, the, one of the reasons why they had difficulty re picking this up because I guess some people within the the censorship board they thought that this movie would encourage or teach people how to get away with mur with murder. Oh, I could definitely see that. Yeah. Yeah, with how uh, thorough these characters go through with their plans, you see every single step of the way. Um, but of course, this being uh, film noir, you know, the main character never gets out of this uh, unscathed. And this was an era where if you're going to have a movie that focuses on the bad guy, the bad guy has to be punished thoroughly. Um, yes. Such is the case with uh, Scarface, the original Scarface. Yes. Uh, let's see. And, oh, there was this one moment before I forget where there was that moment where um, Phyllis and Walter uh, lock lips. They kind of seal the deal on their relationship within uh, his apartment. And then we kind of cut back to uh, Walter's narration in the present day. And then we cut back to Lola, uh, to not Lola, to Phyllis and Walter um, ch uh, relaxing on their couch while uh, Walter smokes. And I'm thinking to myself, was that like an... Uh, like an allegory for them, like just be having sex because there's usually like that after sex cigarettes that you would usually see in film. Yeah. I took it as that too. They kind of have like the, um, you know, pan away moment and then you're back at that moment. And I want to say he's got like, he had his jacket on at first maybe, and he yeah. doesn't have it on now. So uh, right. I'm, uh, that's why I took it as that they had sex and that's, off-camera scene um, right. because they would have shown that back in 1944 right nowadays you would cut to them in bed um you know he's covered by the blankets and right he's still having the cigarette yeah but yeah you couldn't get away with you couldn't i don't i'm not sure i know in television you couldn't get away with showing a couple in bed to get in the same bed together i'm not sure if you're able to do the same with uh in film at this point, but I could be wrong though. Uh, it's been a while since I since I really thought about it. But anyways, yeah. So this is the big moment where uh, Walter somewhat redeems himself a bit by having a yes. change of heart and deciding not to have uh, Zagetti as the fall guy. Um, Zagetti, almost, he has the chance to let Zagetti take the fall for um, Phyllis's murder, and he can get away from this unscathed. I mean, with not counting the bullet in his shoulder. Uh, right. But he decides, you know what? You and Lola, you deserve to be happy. You know, get away from here. Go call the police. Um, no, no, not don't call the police. Just take this, take this nickel. Call Lola. She cares about you. You know, you two be happy together. And meanwhile, and he decides to confess the whole thing to Keys uh, in, uh, with the intention of hopefully escaping to Mexico. Yeah, the only thing I uh, found strange about the Zacchetti scene, and it, maybe it's because um, 
Phyllis was uh, feeding Zaketi that Lola was um, no good for him and unfaithful, is yeah. that Zaketi kind of treats Lola and a few scenes are together like a dick. Excuse my, you know, language. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, he's, uh, like very, he's very paranoid. He's like, so someone's always up to something. Someone's always trying to, um, trying to uh, get the drop on him. Yeah, but I felt like if if Walter had taken uh, Lola's clearly like the the innocent pure person in this story, yeah. um, that if if uh, Walter felt the need to help her out or in some way make up for what he had done, uh, would it just steer that guy away from her? I mean, not to the end of jail, somewhat redeemable, but he didn't seem like he was like the best guy for her anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's a little, it's what a are your weird. thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is kind of a strange decision, but. It's like we never got we from what little we saw of him, we never really see him as like a good person to Lo, to Lola. Just that he was the person who was not very nice to people he doesn't know or people he doesn't like. But Lola, right. we the most we hear about from Lola, it with the most we hear about Zagetti is from Lola herself and how she sees the good in him. Yeah, so, she does because she is like it's kind of like maybe it's one of those indiv- those scenes where. It's kind of the classic trope of, like, he's the bad boy, but with a heart of gold. And you have the kind girl who sees the good side in the bad boy and wants to bring that good side out of him. Okay, yeah. Okay. Now, it could be something like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a plot line I've seen in numerous uh, stories where, yeah, the character... And it's also that classic trope of, like, the young, innocent, sheltered girl was in, is attracted to the seemingly rough-and-tumbled wild boy... Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That it's makes like, sense. ooh, he's dangerous. Mm-hmm. I'm attracted to that. And, and you and I know what that's like, being dangerous individuals ourselves. You know, <laughs> yeah, constantly yeah. having women hound us <laughs> for being bad boys. So, uh, you know. Yes, yes. I, I, I too, I, like, much like you, Matt, I too like to live life on the dangerous, on the fast lane, on the da- live life on the dangerous side. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, the fact that I was originally going to record this with you on Thanksgiving Eve, which is the biggest party night in the United States, shows what a bad boy I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't mean to brag about how tough I am, but you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, I'll have you know that I eat my cer- my cereal without milk. All right. <laughs> Forget that. Sometimes I'll put some soy milk in there if I'm feeling really tough. But yeah, sometimes when, I feel, when I'm feeling really edgy, I'll eat it with water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we're probably losing listeners right now. Let's finish up Most the film, likely. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so anyways, we get to the very end of the movie, and we have the final confrontation between Walter and Keyes, and it's such a heartbreaking moment for, for both the characters, especially yeah. for Keyes, because Keyes, he honestly did saw him like... Uh, like like a, a like a son or someone yeah. he did. Um, he tries to set him on the right path, um, and as much as he did, it ultimately his efforts became fruitless. And there was that really loving moment where, like throughout the entire movie, yes. uh, mm-hmm. uh, he, uh Keys is trying to light his cigarette, but he never has a match on him. So uh, Walter always goes through the effort of giving up one of his matches for Key's uh, cigarette. And here we have Walter trying to do the same, only Key's is the one that lights his cigarette. Yes. And we and at that point, we mention, he mentions that it's like, um, you know I, you couldn't find the right guy because I'm too close, because I was too close. And he said, um, Key's replies, well, you're a lot closer than that. Walter replies, I love you too, man. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, you couldn't see because he's too close. He's right across the desk, and he says uh, it was a lot closer than that, Walter. Um, yeah. And uh, it was great by um, Edward G. Robinson, who with only like a few lines, he basically looks at him and says, "You're all washed up." And yeah, then, he's like, like, he said, uh, yeah, he was like, "You know what? Give it to me. You know, you can tell me how disappointed you're you are in me." And yeah, he just gives him. He just says, "You're all washed up," and that was enough. To, that was all he needed to say to, to express his disappointment in Walter. And you can – in the film, you can see it in, in Edward G. Robinson's face and the way that he says it. Um, mm-hmm. You as the viewer were like, oh, man, yeah. like it, It's crushing for Keyes to see this too, that this was this guy who he saw as um, his – like you said, almost a son and mm-hmm. and that this guy went down this route uh, that he had. He had. So um, right. – and it – and it just fades to black when he lights a cigar for Walter, um, which is good. Because he said, Walter was, you know, he mentions the keys, give me four hours. I'm going to make it to the border. And Key says, you're not going to make it to the elevator. Uh, so Walter tries to walk on and Keys just doesn't even bother to see after him because Key, uh, Walter collapses again before he even reaches the elevator. So Yeah, yeah. And so um, from my further research, I learned that there was actually an alternate ending to this movie. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, where 
there was actually an ending that actually there's a few screenshots here and there that actually shows of uh, Walter uh, not yeah Walter stepping into the gas chamber oh because he does make a comment um he says like you know we can get an ambulance here to fix you up and Walter says for what for me to go through a couple months of you know healing and then being put in the gas chamber uh, I I feel though that the cigar lighting was a better ending than the gas chamber. Oh, what do you oh yeah, absolutely. Because the whole movie was mostly focused on the uh, the relationship between the two, and so it should make sense that um, the movie ends on a shot of them having one last <clears throat> moment together um, in kind of like solidarity bef- um, between uh, before it all goes to hell for. For Walter, and just to focus on, <clears throat> stay on, focus on the disappointment uh, Keys has, which is almost the same in this sort of shot right here. I have a screenshot of the alternate ending, and I'll just share it with you over Skype right now. Mm-hmm. There you go. And it does somewhat tries to mimic what the uh, current ending the official ending has where it just again focuses on the on showing how screwed walter is while focusing on the sadness and disappointment look in the look of sadness and disappointment in key's eyes yeah and i think um one of the you'd mentioned that you need to see the villain kind of get his um come up and pay for what he's done Mm -hmm. is you do see in walter too um how disappointed he is in himself that he let keys down yeah, I feel like. and, and that keys is there to see it uh, to see his own demise. It's like right. it's kind of like one of those things where it's like you never like if you were to mess up. One of the last things you ever want to to see is like your own parents' own your parents' own disappointment in you. And exactly. You don't want your parents to find out that you have royally screwed up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the current the ending we ended up with is a lot better, much more emotionally gripping, and le- leaves off on a very uh, sad note, which a uh, yeah. very appropriately sad note. I think that the gas chamber scene would have been a bit too much for this movie. Yeah, I concur. I concur. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was it. We kind of pretty much went through the whole plot. We went through like the rise and fall of Walter and Phyllis's relationship, while also exploring Keys as an individual, as and mentioning Lois, uh, Lola and um, Zichetti, Zichetti along the way. So, final thoughts. What do you think of what are you? What do you think of Double Indemnity overall as both a film as well as one of the uh, the best examples, the earliest and best examples of film noir? Uh, it's a tremendous film. I mean, I would say it's a rating five star, no question about it. Um, mm-hmm. It's not a very long film either, which is good for you know those of us today who are used to uh, you know two to two hour plus films. Right, it's right. very compact. Um, it moves quickly, and it really does set the standard. In fact, um, uh, much of our audience might know uh, this better, and I, I like your opinion on this too. Uh, I feel that Double Indemnity heavily influences, almost to the point where I might say it's a retelling, would be in the uh, the second Sin City movie with the Dame to Kill For. Um, ah, that okay. storyline very much so reflecting Double Indemnity in that, um, you know, Eva Green plays uh, the wife to this rich guy who's mm-hmm. older than her, mm-hmm. acts like she's getting beat up by him, convinces this other guy to come in and kill the person, you know, um, and the, even like the way they shoot it is very much the same with, the, as you had mentioned, like, you know, the dark shading and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I feel like that's a very a story that's clearly was influenced by Double Indemnity. What do you think if I make that comparison? Oh, yeah, you know, I never really see, saw that um, in the past. But now that you bring it up, yeah, I definitely see the comparisons. And um, it definitely kind of started that another trope. Like before we had the idea of the femme fatale who comes to who approaches the detective in Mal- the Maltese Falcon only to realize that the femme fatale was trying to play up um, was trying to make a patsy out of the uh, detective here we have the idea of the femme fatale trying to um, bring the main protagonist to the dark side and having her fall in, into uh, do, do something horrible for her um so it's like two stats approaches. These are two different approaches to the femme fatale trope that have been repeated over and over again. So I definitely see how 
this move how a st- movie like sim city or a story like sin city a dame to kill for could right. follow in the footsteps of double indemnity yeah and barbara stanwick's character as phyllis just kills it in this role she is great in how conniving and despicable and manipulating she is i felt like oh yeah yeah definitely and it is it it is uh quite it's very it's very fascinating to when you see her like web of lies be un, get unraveled piece by piece as uh walter gets a fuller picture uh, uh gets a, a wider view of the of the large uh, gets a better view of the bigger picture and her scheme to the top to in yeah. and the number the the literal number of dead bodies in her wake yeah yeah uh what are your thoughts on the film uh, let's see. I absolutely love this film. It is uh, very. It's one of the most intense uh, films I have seen in uh, in all my years. It's still. It's a movie that still holds up to this day. Um, mm. It has a lot of substance. It has a lot of style. It has a lot of character. Um, it has everything you really need in a film noir without any of the uh, the tropes that you would often assume a film noir would have. Um, you know, at the right, at, at the, in the first episode, in our first, uh, film noir review, we talked about what is film noir and yes. we talked about it. It's just like a dark story filled with crime, filled with backstabbing, filled with a lot of, uh, tragedy, uh, style. It's a very like stylistic crime and tragedy. And this movie exceeds in all of that. So yeah, absolutely. Much like the Maltese Falcon, this is another movie I highly, highly recommend for anyone who wants to get into film noir. And um, I would like to give a shout out to an individual who goes by the name of Razor Fist. Um, I watch his videos from time to time. And right before we made this review, he actually uploaded uh, his own video, his own take on uh, <clears throat> Dumble Indemnity. And it's more like a analytical uh, essay, sort of um, an, an analytical uh, video essay about it so it's like much more uh it kind of goes into like the historical uh background of the movie going into like the careers of everyone involved in the movie and Mm -hmm. it's uh the movie's uh influence over the film noir genre so yeah if you want to learn more about double and double indemnity i highly recommend checking checking out razor fist's video about it um, but other than that, um, I, yeah, I highly I give it like a five out of five. I easily give it a five out of five, and um, it is definitely ranks up there. It's one of the best, and in fact, even it's um, <clears throat> so high up there that let's see, uh, according to Wikipedia, the U.S. Library of Congress had deemed the movie to be culturally, historically, and, or aesthetically significant in 1992. It was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry in 1998. It was ranked number 38 on the mm-hmm. American Film Institute's list of the 100 best films of all time. In 2007, it rose from 38 to 29th on the 10th in 2007 on the 10th anniversary of their 100 best films ever list. So, it, the movie itself is still highly re- widely regarded by the uh, film industry, by film historians, by film enthusiasts, by just lovers of movies in general. So this is easily a timeless classic of two individuals struck by greed and are eventually do are eventually like doomed from the start from the moment they decide to throw all morality out the window and trying to take advantage of. <clears throat> take, take advantage of the system so yeah um i believe without for the, um i believe there's pretty much nothing else that can be said about this so uh where can people find you matt um at uh www.matthewdenian.com i'm also on facebook as uh matthew denian is my author page matt denian is my um personal page but like i always say if anybody wants to friend me i'll be happy to do that i'm also on uh, twitter and instagram too as um uh, Matt Denyon. So uh, please look for me there. All my work is available on uh, Amazon, and the bulk of it is at uh, severedpress.com. All right, excellent. And as you mentioned at the beginning of the movie, you have a new um, novel coming out, which is uh, Atomic Rex. Uh, what is it? Uh, Conqu- Conquest, Conquest of Chimera. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Atomic Rex, Conquest of Chimera. 
uh, we're featuring a crossover between your most famous character and your very first character that you created yes. or severed pressed. Uh, let's see, I'm definitely looking forward to that because, yeah, I, from what I've read of your work, um, Chimera is still, to me personally, like my favorite uh, book of yours. And so I can't wait to see what sort of continuation you will have for the character and for uh, the, the, that universe's characters. Yeah, that's uh, my favorite character, too. And uh, I think one of the characters in that book might follow Kaiju Noir on YouTube, if I remember correctly. Just, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. There, might, there might be <laughs> might be a little little Easter egg there related to this yeah. particular channel, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, you might, you, might, you might get a kick out of that audience if you happen there to... There you go. If you happen to hear a certain YouTuber get mentioned in a particular book that's actually published. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. So um, as for me, you can check out my review for Godzilla, Planet of the Monsters, uh, where it's the very first Godzilla animated movie that's currently in theaters in Japan. Um, I got that because I happen to live in Japan. I was gracious enough to get a chance to see it and give my first thoughts before most people. Uh, so if you're curious, you can check that out. Minor spoilers there. You can check out the latest episode of our my live stream with Brayton Connor, Audio Synchronicity, Episode 3, where we cover a couple of crazy insane stories while following up following it up with a bunch of q a set uh questions and you can check out matt and i's previous review on the maltese falcon which we heavily referenced here yes with um both of these films as we mentioned numerous times in this video um the them how setting up the uh, like kind of setting the standards for all future noirs to come in the future you can also look forward to a series of re-uploads that i plan on making unfortunately toho has taken down the large majority of my 90s godzilla reviews so i plan on uploading all of the 2015 2016 heisei reviews between um Godzilla, the return of Godzilla and Godzilla vs. Destroya, and uploading all of them um, by with a couple of new enhancements to make the whole presentation better. A new intro, new outro, and perhaps some music thrown in there to up and to uh, ante up the uh, presentation in uh, <clears throat> in preparation for my upcoming latest review for Godzilla 1998. So hopefully everyone will look forward to those, as well as Matt Denning's work. Thank you very much, Matt. It's as always, it's been a pleasure being able to have you on here talking about a subgenre, a genre, or a style, a stylistic genre of cinema that you and I heavily enjoy. Oh yeah, uh, thank you for having me too. It's uh, I feel like we're kindred souls with this. Who else loves giant monsters and noir films? You know, right. so we can do this together. It's a, it's so. a very odd, it's a very incredibly odd pairing that yeah. just so happens to match up between the two of us. Uh, we're also big Looney Tunes fans, right? So let's look forward to that at some point. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like you meet a someone who ha whose favorite genre music genres are like '80s rock and '40s jazz. It makes yeah, exactly. no sense, but it just so have that just so happens to be the case here. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, that yeah, that's pretty much why I call myself Kaiju Noir. I love to embody those two th genres. And luckily I have someone here who can relate to that. So be look on the lookout for future review, noir reviews between the two of us. I don't know what review we'll cover next, but whatever it will be, I'm sure it'll be just as fun as, as this one here. So hope you everyone enjoyed. And until next time, I have been Andres Perez, a.k.a. Kaiju Noir. And I'm Matthew Denyan. And until next time, everybody, take care.